What I will say, though, is that normally when the board pairs and you are representing a number of different hands, now this is a little bit better for you because there is a straight out there, but if the board was like, say, seven deuce five, and now the turn was a seven where you didn't have any straights, it's not a great card to continue bluffing because... Interesting hand here, interesting vlogger hand from uh, Wes Cutshaw. And this one comes pre-pandemic, and it's a doozy of a hand, and it's against his friend Albert once again. And we talked about this before on other shows. Albert played against me in several hands back in the March TCH Austin vlog of 2020, by the way. This is pre-pandemic, and they're all free up there on TCH Austin. But uh, Wes, you're going to be playing, again, sort of in the straddle here, right? Like in the, you know, you get yeah. into these spots a lot in the straddle. If you straddle a lot, you're going to be in the straddle a lot. That's just how it works out. <laughs> so you're in the straddle here, and we'll go through here in the hand. We've got a one guy who limps in, and then your buddy Albert from mid position makes it sort of 55, it looks like. And it gets back over to you. And first, I think you're in the first straddle because it's 10. You guys usually play 5-5, yeah. 5-10. Five, 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 so mm -hmm. first straddle, and you have ace-4 suited. Now, this is kind of interesting. I'll tell you what ended up happening you called and the guy in the middle called and i believe the way that we're going to put this up is we probably have put up a hand of yours before this particular one but we keep getting into these discussions about sort of suited hands in the middle and your sort of forte of you're you kind of used to calling in these particular spots if i was heads up against albert like if this limper i would definitely this is just a call all day um i actually might consider three betting here to get the limper out but i don't right. think calling is really all that bad just know that you're probably going to bring the guy into your left yeah yeah i didn't expect a I don't expect a limper to fold a lot of times yeah. these guys their game theory is i'm going to limp so i can call <laughs> right, you know, right as opposed right. to raising it re-raise that's that's actually their game theory yeah. so i actually don't assume a lot of times i'm actually shocked when they do fold for you know you get in for 10 and you fold to 55 after two people have put money in I, I always wonder what hand could that possibly be so i didn't think he would fold but like i said in the previous hands whether it's right or wrong, I'm actually comfortable and used to playing so multi-way that I don't feel the need. And, and this could be completely wrong, but I don't always feel the need uh, to try to get it heads up. And I tend to do that more so when I'm in position. I'm just like, yeah, let's not let anybody else get in this hand. Let's just get this heads up. And then when I'm in a blind scenario, I usually just call. Or if my hand's bad enough, you know, maybe I turn that into, like if I had A6 of hearts, like I don't, play, I don't like playing the hand, the aces that can't make a straight. So if I had a hand like A6 suited, I might decide to three bet that one where I would just call with other ones. Although I will say a newer school thought to that, though, is, is that you actually want to lean towards three betting better hands. And that's why I've done several stuff. That's why usually suited hands are good game, uh, good sort of hold, hold selection, like sort of frequency selection hands. So what I would counter that by saying, actually, I would want to three bet a better hand and just call with the A6 suited. Subtle thing. But you go to the flop three ways, and I was just going to say I I would probably lean towards folding the a six where a lot of people call with all their suited aces in oh, a lot yeah. of spots. Okay, but then yeah. I then I turn I turn into folds. Yeah, uh, board comes out seven of diamonds, three of diamonds, five of hearts. Again, it's three ways, so you're out of position. Hidden hidden one. You've got ace four here, so you got a double yeah. right wheel draw. Got mm -hmm. to double, double cut to a six backdoor flush draw and ace high. Check, check, over to Albert, who C-bets like 100, probably into like 175. So, you know, sort of in between. And now you got your first choice here, right, of what to do. Yeah. Uh, I want to say I would probably do this, you know, to say every time is, mm -hmm. is kind of crazy, right? But I think I'm, I'm check-raising this against most people almost all the time. Um, we can have this kind of flop in our range uh, very easily where he can't. Um, I would be check raising all my two pairs, all my sets, and then all my draws. I don't have any over pairs that I'm going to play that. Like I don't have pocket eights that I flatted with, and now I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think this is a pretty scary board if you're sitting on ace king to get check raised on. Um, even if you float, you're going to get blown off a lot on the turn. So like I don't even mind if he calls because he's going to have to fold those hands on the turn, but maybe we can just get him to fold like a, a black King queen right here on the flop. Yeah. Your hand is so big here in the sense that, I mean, I look at it as kind of like, it could be a 
13 out draw. People are, what do you mean bars 13 out draw? Well, he's got an open ended straight draw here, which is eight. He has a backdoor flush draw, which you count as one. And he might even have three over cards, like if Albert had like queens or kings. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously, ace four diamonds being the bigger draw. So, usually when you get a big draw, um, those are the ones that you start to have a raise with. What's interesting here is with this other guy in the hand to your left. Sometimes you want to, if you ever play big O, sometimes you might actually in the multi-way spot might want to play this hand as a pull, a quote unquote pull, where there's a possibility that somebody might actually have a lower draw than you. Mm -hmm. um, if Albert has a pair that he's not folding, like if he has queens, then you don't actually want to get the guy to your left out of the hand when you have the nut draw. Cause you're not, cause you still have to, cause Albert's not going anywhere. You just want more money in the pot. You don't want yeah. to have him to fold like nine, seven. So whether or not I might check raise here or not, I think that it certainly has merit. I might do it more often heads up where I don't feel like ace four necessarily has as, as much showdown value. It can't be a mistake for check raising. I think it's probably pretty, pretty close. So you made it 350. And this guy folds right in between, and now Albert calls. Now, before we go to the turn, because I sort of know what's going to happen here, and it, it plays into how we're going to play the future streets. If Albert c bets ace king or ace queen, and you check raise here, is it is he folding on the flop? I, I assume not always. No. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, <laughs> Especially not if, he has, if he has the ace of diamonds, he's not folding. Okay, so if he has the ace, and that's, bet, that's my assumption. Yeah, that's my assumption. so if he so he might see bet ace king or ace queen here, and he's not folding to a turn bet. Okay, that's interesting I mean, to know because a I lot mean, of people he, would just fold if they see bet. Yeah, I mean, once I think that he 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 knows how I play well enough, and he doesn't play that much differently. You know, as far as he's willing to put pressure on people in spots like this mm -hmm. without having the nuts, right? So mm -hmm. I think he knows that um, he's ahead of my range. Yeah. Um, and he knows he's getting killed by, you know, if I actually have it, but mm -hmm. he's going to take like a black five on the turn, maybe not a black five, but a black six on the turn. And he's, he's not going to probably keep chawing down with ace high, but you know, if he gets any kind of improvement, ace king or a diamond, let's say he did have a diamond. No, he's not just going to fold. Even if the turn was maybe a six of diamonds, I'm just trying to think of like a really, what would be normally be a bad card. If he was to improve somehow to a draw, he might continue. And it also depends on my sizing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I, he's it's only 200 and you know what it was 230 or something to call um on the turn if i bet 300 and he's you know picked up that draw he's not going to fold but if i bomb you know 600 he's going to probably fold so it's possible he just wanted to see if i was full of it or not with a hand with some overs um but i, I didn't really i mean i did think ace king was possible as far as hands that i'm going to need to bet the turn to get to fold and then i wondered uh, what's he going to do with over pairs? And I wasn't sure. Uh, oh, you mean he, he might even pairs. like re-raise you with over pairs? No, but just like how hard am I going to have to hit this turn to get pocket jacks to fold, assuming I don't hit? Okay. So he makes the call and your head's up. So you put in 700 on the flop and the turn here is the seven of hearts. So you now pick up, obviously like the net, you know, you pick up your heart draw now. So, I mean, you could have, as many as like 15 out, I mean, well, no, maybe 14 out, something like that. And, and even more 17 outs if you had like Kings, um, you know, with one card to come in a spot like this and, you know, the pot being like 865. So you come out and you bet 625. Now I go back and forth with this because, because again, where you, where you are, supposed to be betting the highest volume with your draw is your best draws. And you like have one of the absolute best draws here. What I will say though, is that normally when the board pairs and you are representing a number of different hands, now this is a little bit better for you because there is a straight out there. But if the board was like say seven deuce five and now the turn was a seven where you didn't have any straights, it's not a great card to continue bluffing. Because especially if you're in a position where you don't have two pair here, you do because you're in the, the straddle. So I can buy seven, five, uh, maybe even seven, three suited. But some people try to run this where like they flat called in the small blind and it's seven deuce five. And now the turns a seven and they check raise the flop and they continue to bet. And, and it's like, well, now your full house combos like went down. You didn't have seven, five here. It's a little bit different. So I would just say in general, when the board pairs and you're check raising a draw from out of position, 
it's a good time to shut it down. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? I, I, I didn't like that this was a seven. Uh, I liked that it was a heart. Yeah, right. And yeah. my sizing kind of shows how I felt about it, um, was that I'm going to have to really convince this guy, Albert, that, that I've got something. Um, I can't just kind of like fancy half bet pot and expect him to fold. Because if he has an overpair, you know, not... If he has an overpair and let's say the three came, you know, I've had him in a lot of spots like that where I'm just like, oh my God, I just sucked out on two pair. Um, you know, the seven doing top pair isn't quite the same, but he has two pair now. You know, if I had a five, three hand, if I had, like you said, uh, I guess anything with a seven, he's, he's way behind, but I didn't like that it was a seven, like it was a heart. And I decided, okay, I'm just going to bet bigger and see if I can get a fold from if he's calling down again. If he did have that ace king with the diamond, um, or, is he really Can calling get... ace-king with a diamond to like a uh, one-third or half pot size bet on the turn? On the turn, if the turn was a diamond. No, no, we... but I mean, if the turn's a seven. Not, but I mean, not now. I mean, here's that's my... what I'm saying. So here's my thinking I, I is, that, is that... I was going to say, I was going to group in the, the pairs, though. So the sizing got bigger because, well, he also still has those, you know, nines through whatever. Now, right. he's not folding aces or kings. People are just going to be stubborn. But, you know, does he have queens, jacks, tens? You know, it gets stronger as he gets tens and nines. Will he fold nines now to 600 versus 300? Um, I think the answer is yes. I think, I think the sizing does matter when you have those pairs that are just over the board. Um, where I think if I continued to bet, you know, like a half pot, that he would, uh, it'd be easier for him to call. Well, let me play devil's advocate with you. And I don't know what level Ab Ab Albert is on. But if I'm in Albert's spot here... Why would I fold nines or tens now that when the card comes, you have less combinations of what you're representing? Like if you're saying on the flop that you've got a full house, I mean, you have a set of sevens, threes, fives, mm -hmm. or two pair or straight. Well, if the turn's a 10, none of your value combos are going away. If your turn's a seven, a bunch of them have. Now you've got only quad sevens, combinations mm -hmm. of seven, five go down. Now I will acknowledge that some live players actually think like this, but from a thinking player's perspective, or if you put me in that spot, like I'm never going to fold nines or tens now that a seven comes. A seven's a good card for me. Also, too, there's a, a hair of factoring the fact that if you do have a straight, I now at least have a chance to win yeah. if I have tens in the form of hitting a set at the end or another seven, just a little bit. So so that's that's definitely why I didn't like the seven, but then I guess my thought was just don't I have to bet? I have, you know, I, I turned a great card for me. I can't change that card into a six. So don't I need to bet? So then the question is, what's my sizing? And I went bigger thinking maybe I could fold out some of the hands that he's, he, that he's didn't love calling the check raise in the flop. And now he's just like, okay, okay, fine, whatever. And well, we'll I mean, but, to, to answer your question, no, you don't, you, the, to be, you know, sort of, if you wanted to play a balance game, you certainly are supposed to have some check raises and then give ups. So, yeah. How you would balance that though, and I, I, I definitely probably play this spot unbalanced, is that if you actually had a full house here, you're probably supposed to check a fair amount of the time because you're checking your give ups too. Mm -hmm. Now you can right. play very exploitable live and it wins you more money where I probably wouldn't do that. I'd probably check my give ups and just continue to bed small with my my big hands. I mean, we all know sometimes unbalanced play is the sort of the best play. So I would just say no. I did, and, and also to moving around to the river, I don't know if he's folding over pairs to it, the, the larger sizing. He probably shouldn't be. And if we just trying to get him to fold like the ace king, that's why maybe I have an issue with the sizing. But okay. I think the more interesting thing here is on the river. You bet 625. He tanks and tanks and tanks. He calls. All right. 625 into like 800 and change. So it looks like the pot's what? 22, 23. Doesn't have to be exact. Uh, seven, three, five, seven, right? And now the river is an offsuit queen and you have 2,800 left or so. Like yeah, 2,800 of the pots, yeah. the pots like 2,100 or something. Yeah, 2,100. So now that he calls the turn and you have the hearts, right? What do you think he has? What is his range when he calls the turn to your So 600? I started, when I saw this river, you know, of course it's, it's horrible. You know, it's a horrible river. Um, I, I guess I would be okay with, uh, maybe a 10, you know, something that doesn't smack the over cards that he could have been calling with. So I started to wonder how many times does he have like an ace king of diamonds that just completely missed ace jack of diamonds where, you know, he's not going to re-raise me if I check raise those hands on the flop. He's going to play them the same way. Of course, if he has a hand like king queen of diamonds, uh, you know, I'm in trouble. Um, 
But I started to just think, you know, does he have, is there any overhands that he turned, um, not turned, but flopped a flush draw that I could get to fold? Or will he still, again, that same thing, is he going to now hero call with nines? Where you said on that turn card, you kind of, with nines, tens, you're like, okay, uh, he's not supposed to have this many combinations. And the thought was, can I get him to believe me now on this river by continuing? And I, And again, I felt like I was just in a spot where I didn't know which rivers were good or bad. And this is the whole reason we brought up this, these hands is I didn't know which rivers necessarily were the, the complete shutdowns when you put this much money in and which ones were just like, yeah, you got to go for it. You know, you're, 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 he's going to fold, you know, enough of the time. So clearly in this spot, betting pot or more than pot, we got to get him to fold, you know, probably like almost 40% of the time, uh, 35 to 40% to be profitable. And I just didn't know what to do, to be honest. This is this is one, you know, the reason we brought this up. I didn't know what to do, and I just went with the strongest play, which was to try to take it down, uh, ripping in twenty eight hundred dollars here. So, and, to, uh, so to answer your question, uh, you know, which rivers am I supposed to do this on? Uh, yeah, I would strongly advise that this is not a good river. Now, this is yeah. not this is not a good river for you to do this on. Not, I, I think I heard you say because, well, maybe he has over cards in the sense that it connects. I, I would say that more importantly. The reason why this isn't a good river is because it doesn't affect any of the semi bluff hands that you might that start structuring. Yeah, this big bluff with. So basically, mm-hmm. what this means is you've just missed, right? Yeah. An offsuit queen. I don't think the actual card in itself has any relevance in terms of his hand strength. Like if I'm in his spot, and again, maybe he doesn't think this way. Whether I have nines, jacks, aces, kings. The only thing that this card matters is that it misses a lot of your draws. Like I, it, I can't fold. No. I don't think I'm folding tens no. and calling so my, faces. My, my, my point was only that uh, the story now has been told for three streets. Well, absolutely. No, I mean, yeah. That, the, I, so sure. not not that this card helps me in any way, but I've already, I've I've been willing to put this much money in. Are you really think nines are the bet? Over a hundred hands, does he mm-hmm. really think nines are just a call here? So that was my thought was, this is a horrible card. It doesn't represent what I have. It can hit actually some of his hands, but I don't know on the third street if he's going to call me down with eights or nines or tens. And then to uh, answer your other part of your question, what cards would be good here for you that maybe might not make your hand? That I miss, yeah. Uh, the front door diamonds. I, mm-hmm. I think bluffing the front door diamonds. And then like a four. Right. Are you bluffing all the front door diamonds, even like the queen kings, uh, the, big, the bigger cards? The more or, the I mean, cause... the more the front door diamonds are a little bit smaller and connected. The be- I mean, obviously you don't need to yeah. bluff the six of diamonds, right? Because you'd make a straight. Yeah. Uh, you know, the lower the diamonds, probably the better. The only thing I'm thinking of is just the off chance again, very very subtly. If it's a high diamond that he might run into a full house, but yeah, you know. exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean that's. The whole idea of structuring a backdoor bluff here, which you do, if you've done well with the ace four hearts, is that you get to represent the front door and you get to represent a lot of the one liners here too. So I think maybe a nine, most importantly, the offsuit four diamonds and a nine are probably some of the best cards to, to run this bluff. High sort of bricks, I would just be like, give up offsuit ace. You can just check, hope you win. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, so I would probably shut this one down even if I went for it on the turn. I just, like I said, my case is that I think you actually might even be able to go smaller in the turn, get him to fold out his bullshit, and then not mm-hmm. have to do, you know, he's going to hold on. Yeah. What ended up happening? Did it get through? So I ended up ripping it, and he tanked for, I think it was three or more minutes, which seems like, you know, five to ten minutes when mm-hmm. you're alive. But I know I put the counter on the vlog, and he tanked and tanked and tanked, and eventually called with a seven. Ooh, trip sevens. So it kind of, I don't want to say it, it uh, justifies my thoughts, but when I saw that, I was like, well, how do you have a seven here? You know, this is luck, <laughs> luck wise, it felt so unlucky that I'm doing this. And he just happens to have a seven. But yeah. he thought so long with a seven that I'm now convinced he would have folded uh, the hands that I thought I was targeting uh, on this river. I still think it's a bad river card and I shouldn't be doing it. But I do feel like those hands would have gone into the muck. And I mean, he tanked forever with a seven, just thinking I, there's no way he's putting all his money in without this, right? And he just eventually was like, you know, I don't care um, and decided to, to call. But uh, it was a long tank. And yeah, I, I see I, thought I, would... I see that point of view. For I, I mean, I definitely probably even agree with you that if he was, and I, I saw that before with him too, like if he was tanking that long, 
he can never fold the seven, not just because of, from his perspective, like he should never ever fold the seven. Yeah, I think so too. Not just because of hand strength, but just because he blocks like a lot of what you're yeah. representing. You know and, and, I mean? the way that, like, and, and the way I look yeah. about that kind of hand is, is, and this is the way I play, is like if I'm never folding a seven, then I'm snap calling a seven. Right. And a lot of people don't do that. They tank forever, but I've already decided in this spot, I can't fold a seven. So it doesn't yeah. matter how much you bet. I'm just, okay, yeah, I call. I, you know, so I was surprised that, on the river, he really had to think about calling with a seven, um, which, you know, of course, when he turns his hand up, I'm like, how, how did we think for three minutes and you have a seven? <laughs> like, you know, this is such a slow roll, but, you know, he, for whatever reason, he was he was convinced that, wow, I, I think he had, well, maybe he doesn't, you know, and yeah. the pitch they called. Yeah, no, that's definitely an interesting one. Thanks a lot, Wes.